This is lecture 28 of ECE 2305. So in this lecture, we're going to cap off. <laughs> we're going to cap off um, t this course. T you know, this final lecture in this course with respect to DNS or domain name servers. Okay. So DNS is we we saw this a little bit when we looked at DHCP and the server architecture in general. And what we did is we kind of said, oh, yeah, 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 there's this DNS server, and you don't have to worry about it. Um, we'll talk about it later. Later is now. And so what we're going to talk about is how we got, <laughs> I'm just going to hold on to this. <laughs> it's too distracting. After, after you guys. When, OK. So what DNS, <laughs> <laughs> so what DNS is all about, oh, there we go. What DNS is all about, or domain name system, if you take the analogy of a human identifier. So not all of us, not all of us really know, like, you know, like for instance, when I communicate with you guys, right? I think I know most of you guys. I think I know everyone's here, everyone's name by name, right? So I say Dan, or Dan, or Austin. Um, I don't know your name. What's your name? Arthur, okay, Arthur. Ah, I knew there was an Arthur. Ah, so what happens is most of us communicate and we associate with name. I don't think most of us talk by social security numbers, right? It's like, oh, hi, um, so and so and so. Although social, U.S. social security numbers are structured in a particular way. So what, what the first three digits actually refer to the region that you apply for your social security number. Oh, I got that. I'm going to stop it this time. I'll start in a few minutes. So what happens is, so how many people are here are from Massachusetts? Hey, and so your social security number probably starts with 026. Is that about right? No? Or ballpark? Yeah, ballpark. Ballpark. It's like 027, 028, right? Um, New Jersey, I'm trying to think. That's like in the hundreds, I think, right? And uh, where I, you know, so what is 009? What? No, no, there is, we, we are not separated from the non-immigrants of this country. No, 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 009, any thoughts? Canada. Yeah, <laughs> we have not been invaded yet, no. <laughs> um, Vermont, Vermont, because what happened was when I, when I got my job offer from the University of Kansas, what I did is, first thing I did is um, Canada and the U.S. have an agreement along with Mexico called uh, NAFTA, North America Free Trade Agreement, which means that I can get something called a NAFTA visa, so TN visa. So what I did is I boomed all the way to the border one hour away, went to the border crossing, got the TN visa stamp and passport, and then I went straight to Burlington, Vermont, and say, I would like a social security number. Never had one before. Canada has their own thing. They call them SINs or SIN. SIN number. And so what happens is the region for northern Vermont is 009. So usually what happens is your social security number will be broken down by where you apply. And I'm not sure what the middle two digits are. The last four are probably unique. But in essence, that's what, that's at least how the SSNs are structured. There's also passport numbers. I don't know the rhyme or reason uh, how they're set up. There probably is one, right? But what happens is with internet, it's the IP address. That's a unique identifier. Every computer has one. And, um, and so, like, you know, and then at the same time, we have, like, you know, this sort of name as well. We say www.google.com. And you saw in experiment three, what happens when you use the dig function to find out the DNS of google.com? You had four or five IP addresses. So what happened is, is that um, the DNS, right, it resolved www.google.com into these multiple IP addresses, right, that we saw before. So each, so one of those several servers is going to handle, let's say, a request that you make to it. So you go to Google, and then it will say, oh, I'm going to let this server take care of your request, right? So what happens is the DNS server maps IP address to name. You know, like, you know, for instance, like, you know, uh, imagine if you wanted to surf WPI's website. What would you do? Do you remember WPI's uh, IP address? No. No, no. You just have www.wpi.edu. So what happens is the DNS server, what it does is it has a hierarchy, right? So there is a structure which we'll look at in a few minutes. And what it does is it kind of relates 
um, you know, the IP addresses with the host name. And so if you have an application that's trying to contact, let's say, another application, uh, server or whatnot, uh, what, what happens is there is this sort of process based on the name. So let's say, uh, regardless, like, you know, so you don't necessarily need the IP address. That will translate it into one, right? And so how does it work? So what, what ends up happening? So let's say, first of all, the structure. So you have, let's say, something like this. Replay1.southcoast.company.com. Okay, so company.com. So that's what we refer to as an alias, right? And so what ends up happening is um, we have this, like, you know, the IP address that corresponds to one name, okay? And so the DNS returns all the IP addresses for that one web server. We saw this with Google.com, right? And what happens is how do we translate this name? And there is a structure. There is a method to the madness. There's hierarchical. There's levels one, two, and three. So you have the root DNS server, right? So the root DNS server... And, and what those root DNS servers, then what they do is that you have then the level two, which is the com, right, commercial in the U.S. Um, you have the .orgs, that's a nonprofit. You have the .edus, that's an educational institution. If you go elsewhere, it's very different. In fact, if you go to another part of the world, you, uh, let's see, which slide is it? You'll have this. So you'll have something instead called a top domain, top level domain server for things like country domains. So you'll, what your TLD is going to be, UK, FRCA, I'm glad it's there, dot, and JP. And then what happens is from the top, top level domain server, you'll have CO.JP, CO.CA. Although usually Canada adopts usually the US convention, right? We have .coms in Canada and .orgs. But in Europe, this is much more popular. You have a .ac, you, dot, you have a .co, and then following that, you have your country uh, TLD, right? And so what ends up happening is you have these three different levels. The third level is something like this, Amazon.com. So we have the level two. It's a commercial entity. And then, okay, it's Amazon. It's a, uh, you know, in this server... Right? Belongs to a, is a commercial entity, and it's Amazon's, right? or FBI, or WPI. And so suppose you have a client. You have an application and says, I want to surf to this guy, www.wpi.edu. So what happens is the client first contacts a level one or root, root server, the DNS server, and it says, OK, from there, it's going to find OK the .edu DNS. And then from there, the .edu queries WPI.edu. So you have this hierarchy. You go to the root. The root then goes to the DNS server responsible for all .edus. Then the .edu DNS server says, oh, you want WPI.edu, and goes to it. And then from the .wpi.edu, it goes to the WPI.edu DNS server to get the IP address of the last and final stage. In this case, it's a web server. W, it's a www, right? And so it should be noted, you do not have this sort of super duper single DNS server for all the world. Doesn't happen. You have to hive in the hierarchies, otherwise you're in very big, deep trouble, right? Imagine you have this one big thing. Web, web, uh, you know, web browsing is going to be really painful. So what ends up happening is, um, you know, you have this root name server, and then it contacts, you know, um, sort of those name servers, and then continues up the hierarchy until you find the like through all those different DNS servers, what the final IP address is going to be, right? And then, of course, as I mentioned before, you have different, uh, you have a top level domain um, server as well. So you have for like comms and orgs, nets, edus jobs, and all these other guys. You also have country t TLDs as well. It should be noted that VeriSign is responsible for all the dot coms. So if you have a root level DNS, it's going to go to VeriSign's server, and, it's going to, and that's the one that handles all the dot coms of the world. Okay? And then the dot com, it's, in turn, it's going to say, oh, you want, let's say, I'm trying to think of a dot com, Amazon.com. Oh, you want to go to this DNS server over here. And it just trickles that way. And that way, what happens is everybody's responsible for their portion of the entire 
you know, the, these names, if you will, the, the names for, um, that represent these IP addresses. So, and then of course you have, in the organization, you have your own DNS server. WPI has one, right? Uh, you saw what happened again with DIG. You saw some other DNS servers over there. And that's usually handled by the organization or, ser um, or service provider, all right? So sometimes these things are not hierarchical. So sometimes what happens, each ISP, the residential ISP, you know, they usually have um, something called a default name server. And so the, that query is usually sent to it directly, right? And so it will have a cache of names to address translation pairs. The bad thing is things get out of date. That's why you usually play with DH, DHCP, because then we have this like long laundry list of IP addresses. Bad thing about that is because the, the DHCP, the IP addresses are always changing, it's usually quite risky to have a name associated with it. Because let's say, oh, I'm going to go point to 130, 123, uh, 26, 2. But it might not be. DHCP, if you log in and you log off and log in again, you might get another IP address and the mapping has to be reestablished, right? So not so good. Uh, there are some services out there that with the right software and everything, you can, um, like, you know, you can say, oh, I'm now this, like, you know, this IP address and updates the DNS server to map now the new, new name to that new IP address. And if you're ever interested, um, DNS runs on port 53. That's why we don't play with port 53 too much. So there are two types. There's recursive and there's iterative uh, queries for DNS. Okay, so let's go through these two different types. So the iterative is the following. So let's say there's AK277, 227 doesn't exist. You can go to room 227, it's not going to be there, uh, .wpi.edu, and want to find big.monkey.edu, uh, okay? So, uh, of course, you know, we all know that Monkey University is the powerhouse that has a great basketball team, right? So. Uh, how do you, how does AK227 want to get the IP address for that specific server? And so, <laughs> so what happens is this guy asks the local DNS server. So, so it's interesting. So first thing the guy does, your server, your, your, sorry, your, your computer does, is it goes to your DNS server at WPI. So suppose there is a dns.wpi.edu. It might or might not exist. I do not know. No one here is from CCC? What? It does not exist. Okay, good to know. So suppose there's a dns.wpi.edu, and what happens is dns.wpi.edu says, uh-uh, I, I, I don't know whose IP address is that. So what it will do is dns.wpi.edu is going to ask the root DNS server. Root DNS is going to say, oh, I don't know who this is, but um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to send you to the TLD, top level, um, top-level domain um, DNS server. And so what happens is now dns.wpi.edu gets rerouted to the TLD DNS server. And what it's going to do is it's going to reroute. That TLD DNS server is going to redirect it to dns.monkey.edu. So what happens is there's a matchmaking that's happening. So dns.wpi.edu, based on the request of ak227.wpi.edu, is going to get routed to dns.monkey.edu, okay? And what happens is dns.monkey.edu uh, is going to say, oh, here's the IP address of big.monkey.edu, okay? And so that, in turn, dns.wpi.edu is going to send that IP address, ultimately pass it on to AK227. So this is iterative, okay? The iterative process, iterative query. The difference here with recursive is almost the same. So you know that DNS at WPI.edu does not have a clue what the IP address of big.monkey.edu is. So it's going to ask the root. The root will ask the TLD. And then the TLD says, I don't know. It's going to go to DNS.monkey.edu. DNS.monkey.edu will send the IP address of Big Monkey to, instead, it's going to send it to TLD, the TLD DNS server. So in the other case, what happens is the matchmaking, the, uh, the dns.wpi.edu is kept in loop all the way to the very end until ma the matchmaking is occurring there. Here, rather, 
it's sort of passed along the individual servers. In this case, it tld.dns. Uh, uh, the server is going to get the IP address and progressively send it to the root DNS server, which will then send it to dns.wpi.edu and then to AK. So what happens is instead of having the, the direct connection between ak227.wpi.edu with dns.monkey.edu, rather what you've got is you have sort of this pass down and then pass up through all these different DNS servers. Okay? So with that, so what have we covered in today's lecture is really where do we get these names for servers? How do they get translated between human language? Because it's kind of ingenious. Imagine something like this that has been around for 20, 30 years, right? These um, different names somehow sort of propagate and are still valid, you know, sure with some modifications like these new additions before .coms and .nets and .uss and .edus. Now we have an additional set of all these, these uh, additional naming conventions. But the, sort of the idea of how we can translate this into an IP address that your IP layer can understand is actually quite, it's quite a nice legacy to have, right? So this kind of in, it ca is a great way of ending 2305. And, you know, sort of congratulations for, to all of you for sort of sticking through from the very beginning uh, where we talk about policy and what is comms all the way to sort of the highest possible layer. Like, you know, before we start implementing actual applications and stuff. So the best that we can hope for is actually doing socket programming. So, so with that, um, you know, that, that concludes uh, lecture 28. <laughs> ah! <laughs> so anyways, that was, sorry, you can keep that. <laughs> so, okay, so with that,